the Old Testament lesson today is Jonah chapter 1. Now, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the marines were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country, and of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. And then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? The sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Our New Testament lesson comes from Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let's go to the Lord in prayer for understanding his word. Lord, we bless your name. Thank you for giving us your word. You have preserved it through the ages. You have presented it to us in ways that we can understand. We can know the way to salvation because you have communicated it to us clearly. We pray that we would understand how to live and how to read these verses and what this means for us as individuals and as a church. We pray that our hearts would be filled with worship and awe and that that would drive us into action in our daily life. 
In Christ's name, amen. This week, I'm going to be starting the first in a series of messages about evangelism, learning evangelism from Jesus. And so that will be this week and next week, and we'll have a few weeks um, uh, in between, and then I'll be preaching Sunday evenings with the remaining uh, eight lessons. Um, so this lesson here, we're going to begin with the Great Commission. This is really kind of starting at the end of the Gospels, right? Learning evangelism from Jesus. This is right before he's going to be ascending. So we're kind of starting at the end and taking a look at things from this uh, particular vantage point. And right here, you know, right before this part of the passage in chapter 28, we see a great earthquake and an angel whose appearance is like lightning and the stone being rolled away from Jesus's tomb, right? He had died. He had literally actually been put to death. But these things happened to announce that he did not stay dead. The angel told uh, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, he's risen. He's gone. And they received a message. Tell the disciples, those 11 remaining disciples, to go meet me back in Galilee, right? The place where everything started. That's where Jesus selected these disciples and taught them for three years. And they're walking here and there in Galilee. And they finally come to Jerusalem. And a couple weeks in, he's, he's dead. But then they get this message, this amazing news that actually he's alive and he's telling us to go back home to the place where it all started back to Galilee and so that's why we read at the beginning there the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. they haven't seen him yet there's there's still a sense of like is this real uh, there's that sense of doubting is this is this w what's really going on um, is is he really risen is this really what's happening right now um, and they also may be doubting because the, the last thing that they've done in relationship to Jesus was they've denied him before other people. Um, they have fled for their own lives. They didn't stand up with him to be crucified alongside him, right? And so there's a, there may be also doubt of, okay, is this Jesus? And if it is, what's he going to say to us? What we're going to be focusing on here is the fact that Jesus says, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. And I really want to stress that therefore, right? Why is he saying go, therefore? What's different now that makes it so that they can go and make disciples of all nations? Why weren't they doing that before? Why wasn't that part of the mission when Jesus was alive? Why is the, what is new now? that therefore make disciples of all nations, right? The text right before it says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That's, that's the big change. That's the big news. All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples. And so just a few thoughts. Christ... Jesus Christ is God. He has always been God, seated in the throne on heaven before he became a man, right? So there's something, there's something strange here because he had all authority beforehand, right? He didn't need to come down. He didn't need to lower himself and to empty himself and to give up his authority and to become a man and to become weak and to be killed and humiliated. He didn't need to do all that. He already had authority to begin with. But right now, he has done all of those things because that authority was the authority to say who can come into the kingdom of heaven and who would stay out. He has always had that. But having lived a perfect life and died a death in our, in, in our place, he, has, he is exercising his authority to be the gatekeeper of heaven and saying, you may come. And we'll talk more about that later. 
At the beginning of Matthew, the pronouncement is made, the kingdom of God is at hand, right? It's so close that if you just put your arm out, your hand would be touching it. It's that close. The kingdom of God is at hand. But now, it's not just at hand. It's all around you. Anywhere that you put your foot, that's the kingdom of God. Any place that you can think of, that's the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God's already here. Jesus has been given all authority over heaven and earth. Now, Christ's commandment, we're going to be looking into the grammar a little bit of it, but we see four verbs there, right? It says, go, make disciples. That's actually one word in the Greek, to make disciples. Um, uh, baptizing and teaching, right? So the go part is kind of a helping verb, and it's, it's a continuing action, like going, right? Or as you go. So wherever you are, as you go, and the, word next, the next word is make disciples. This is actually the only imperative in the sentence, right? So that's a participle, and then this is the imperative, right? This is the word that is a command. This is the one that he is directing to you. You obey this word. Make disciples. That is the command in this sentence. And the following verbs are participles as well, just like go. But they come after it, and they summarize what it means. Right? You are to make disciples by means of baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and teaching them everything that I have commanded you to do them. So this emphasis here is on discipleship. What does it mean for the apostles to fulfill the Great Commission, this mission that God has laid out for them to do? Um, and I do want to uh, point out that this, this is originally given to these 11 disciples. This is a special commission for them to do as apostles. What does that mean for us? I'm not an apostle. You're not an apostle. But they, in their obedience, are establishing Christ's church. And the church is the vehicle by which Christ has brought salvation into this world. And so when we confess in, in, the, in, in our creeds that we are a holy apostolic church, right? We as a church corporately together, we're following this. This is a command to us, the church. Now, I might, I might not be getting on an airplane to go to, to China or Afghanistan personally myself, right? I might not be sent to go there, but we as a church corporately together. We are sending people. All of these flags we have in the back room is a testament that to, to the fact that this is an apostolic church. There is a going. There is a sending. The gospel is, uh, and this is the gospel that we're they're giving, that the kingdom uh, has come that there is salvation. And, and he doesn't mention in this version of the Great Commission uh, proclaiming the word, right? It says, make disciples, baptizing them, and then it says teaching them after that. Um, but in Mark's version and Luke's version, it says he, he uses different words, right? He says, proclaiming the good news of Jesus. And I just want to emphasize that this is not a contradiction Right? Each of these authors is saying fully what is true, what Christ has told them, but they're emphasizing different aspects of it. And what Matthew is emphasizing is that this is not just a gateway. Just, we're not just trying to like shovel refugees in. Right? It's, not just, it's not just, okay, get them saved and then don't worry about it anymore. Right? If we get them to say this prayer, if we get them to, to do this thing, then, okay, whew, our job's done. Don't need to, we don't have another job after that. Let's go on to the, to the next. No, the call for the Great Commission isn't just get people into heaven. It's make disciples. It's equip those people once they've heard. It's not just having people who are, okay, you're, you're safe. You're out of the, under the dominion of sin, and now, now the job's done. No, now you're a citizen of the kingdom. 
right? You're a citizen, a full citizen, and, and now you are to, to work to be a disciple, a learner, and to operate, to do the things that the people who told you were doing, to grow and to develop those gifts that God is giving you, and to exercise those in the kingdom. So the Great Commission is not just speaking the good news and proclaiming it, but it is also the follow-up to that. It's both and, proclaiming the word and following it up, making those disciples. And that should affect how we approach people, right? Um, how we think about evangelism. How do we, we, we need to do the proclaiming part, but there needs to be the intentionality afterwards. Um, the problem here is that not only as individuals, but as a group of individuals, we are insufficient for this task. We are not enough to make disciples, right? There are closed borders out there that we have a hard time getting through. Worse than that, there are hardened hearts, hearts that are hardened by, this, by sin against this truth. There are minds that are indoctrinated against these true things that, that, they, they, that no matter how good at arguing and explaining you are, you cannot penetrate it. In our own strength, we are not enough. Further, we're making disciples, but we're not making, I'm not making disciples of Josh, right? What, kind of, what, what use would that be? Jesus says in, in chapter 23 of Matthew, you know, don't even call yourself teachers. Don't even call yourselves, none of you are instructors, none of you are fathers. There's only one teacher, there is one instructor, there is one Father in heaven. The structure of his church is that we are disciples, all of us. We are learners. That's what that word means. We are learners. We are all learners. And the person that we learn from, the one teacher, the one instructor, the one father we have, is Jesus Christ. And that there's something impossible about that. How can you come to me and become an, a, a disciple of somebody else, right? You know, you've, you've heard of Socrates. He was a, a great philosopher, and he taught all sorts of people, and people were his disciple. And there's one, he had a disciple named Plato. He was a disciple of Socrates, and then Socrates dies, drinking hemlock. And you know what? A lot of people come and learn from Plato, and you know what they're called? Not Socrates' disciples. They're, even though most of everything Plato got, he got from Socrates, they're called Plato's disciples. And then after him, Aristotle. He learns everything from Plato, and then he adjusts things and he grows things. But his disciples are called disciples of Aristotle. And so who are we to say that you've learned things from me, you're now a disciple of Jesus. We can do these things because Christ has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. And he has called us his church and given us that green light. You make disciples in my name. Right? That's why we're not teaching everything that we think is good. We're not teaching them a bunch of good advice. No, teach them everything that I have commanded you. Right? So as disciples, as evangelists, as spreaders of this good news, we only say one thing, and that is the truth that God has given to us in this word. We can make disciples because Christ has been given authority and he has commissioned his church to do so. Now, when the text says, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth, that's a phrase that, that those words heaven and on earth means everything. It is completely all-encompassing. There's nothing in existence that Christ does not have authority over. And, and while that, it, I'm going to actually sep, uh, organize the way we talk about it in those terms of heaven and earth, spiritual realms and earthly realms, but just so you know that the term itself, the phrase itself, just means absolutely everything. There's, not, there's no speck of matter, there's no square inch of space that isn't owned and under the full authority of Jesus Christ in this moment. 
And so first we will look at the spiritual realms. How does Christ having authority in the spiritual realms, how does that empower us as a church to make disciples? And then how does him having authority over all earthly realms, how does that empower us to make disciples? So having authority over all spiritual realms, um, he sends us to baptize people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, right? These three are one God. It says right there, it says the name, singular name, the one name of these three persons. And we are given that, as the church, we're given that responsibility. Now, one thing we see in Jesus' ministry is that he has already on earth, he has power over demons and uh, um, basically any wicked spirit. Right? He, he, he approaches the, the man, in the, who's com- the, the demon-possessed man in the tomb, and they proclaim, they, they shout out, What have you to do with us, Son of God? Have you come to torment us before the appointed time? That's Matthew 8, 29. Um, and we know that there is, there's an animosity towards us, in our salvation, an animosity towards God. Even from the very beginning, we have the serpent, who is Satan, trying to get Adam and Eve to go against God's will. And P- Peter tells us that Satan is like a lion looking for whom he may devour. Jesus tells Peter that Satan wants to sift you like wheat. And yet every time Jesus comes into contact with a, with a demon, with an evil spirit, with an unclean spirit, they cower before him. They, they just are in dread of him. This one says, have you come to torment us before the appointed time? They know their days are numbered. But they also know that there is a time in the end when judgment is coming and they will be all thrown into a lake of fire. And so they understand that this Jesus, this Son of God, has all authority over them. And the timeline right here is strange because at that point, Jesus was in his earthly ministry. He had not come to completely destroy and to judge them yet. But he will. He has all power over the spiritual forces in this world. There's nothing that can come against us in doing our work that Christ does not make quiver if, if you are ever afraid of monsters under your bed, I had night terrors for way too long. I would always run to my, my parents, and, and I just could not sleep. I was always afraid. Jesus is kind of like the monster under the bed for these demons. They quake at the thought of him. They cannot stand that, that he, is, he was walking on earth. They cannot stand that he is exalted in heaven because they fear and tremble. And so we should have no fear of them. That has nothing that can, they have nothing that will stand against us, we who are following the command of, our, of Christ, our captain. Christ has, been, has all authority over heaven and in, uh, in, in the spiritual realms, which includes us, our souls, our spirits, our hearts, to convict them right? We're often afraid to tell people and to proclaim the gospel to people, to talk to our friends about Jesus, because we're not convinced that it will be effective. And some people will not come to know Jesus, and some people, you may have to tell them ten times, a hundred times, or maybe you just need to not talk about it for a little while, and then take the temperature again later and say, what, what are your, what are your, what, what, where are you at right now? What are your thoughts on God? How are you doing? And those sorts of things. But we don't want to do it at all because we don't think that it will be effective. Right? Now, there's, there's other things we're afraid of. We're afraid of losing friendships. We're afraid of uh, looking dumb or being made fun of. Um, 
But the fact is, if we believed, if we really, if you knew that telling people about Jesus and explaining the gospel in a simple and true way as it's presented in scriptures will change their heart, if you knew that it was going to happen, there'd, there'd be nothing to be afraid of. Right? There's, of course, of course we would do it. There's, you could just do it and say, well, of course I won't be made fun of because the Spirit will convict their heart to change. But we don't know that that'll happen every single time. We only know that this is the method and means that Jesus has given us, that he has ordained for us to use. How will they know? How, you know, you, we, are believe, we, we are saved because we believe. Anybody who believes will be saved. But how will they know unless somebody tells them? And maybe think about that in another terms, because we live in a place where everybody knows the name of Jesus, but not everybody understands the gospel, right? You'd say probably 98% of people have heard in, this, in our particular community about God and Jesus and the Bible, but how many of those people actually understand what the gospel is and what it means? And so there's a call and a commission in that respect. And the, the encouragement is that it's kind of like saying, um, there's a, a saying, don't worry, you're a worse sinner than you ever realized, um, but God's grace is greater. Um, and the, the fact is, don't worry, you can't convince anybody. You really can't. You really can't change anybody's heart. It's nowhere near your wheelhouse. You have no power to do it. But Jesus does. And by the power of his word and his spirit, he makes our feeble attempts fruitful. We had a, a friend back home who, I'm ashamed to say, I didn't think would ever actually come to a saving knowledge of Christ. He was just the type of person who always needed to be devil's advocate and just kind of, he would always, oh, you, oh, you have something to say? Well, what about this? What about this? And not in a sincere way, mind you. There are sincere questioners who have very good questions, and we ought to do our best to answer those questions as well best as we can to work hard for it. This was an insincere questioner who wanted to just find holes and pick fights and, 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 and make things as difficult and uncomfortable as possible because that's fun for him. And after talking and talking, all these talks, um, and even he even started coming to church and he even said, yeah, no, I'm convinced. But then he did the same thing and he fell away and we're just like, okay, I, and I have to confess in my heart, I didn't think that anything was going to come of it, but we still prayed for him, and we still talked to him, and then when we were in seminary, uh, learning over in St. Louis, he messages me out of nowhere and says, hey, um, I'm, it, I'm, I'm for real this time. I, I, I really did come you know, I, I really do believe. Do you have any books? Do you have anything that I can read? Do you have anything that, to help me understand better what this, what all of this is? And there's nothing that I could have said because I said everything. I said everything. I made every argument. I did everything in my power. the The extent of my knowledge and abilities were used up, and he left unsaved. But the Holy Spirit worked in his heart and convicted him of his sin and brought him into his kingdom. Christ has sovereign power over our hearts to convict us. And that gives us strength. That gives us encouragement. That gives us encouragement in our failures as people who talk about Jesus. Because even, we don't know, five years later, maybe you'll get a, an email or a phone call and say, hey, you know some stuff about this, this Bible, this, this Jesus. Where do I start? Jesus also has full authority over heaven. And 
He has authority over who comes in and who goes out. He's always had that authority, but he would only choose to exercise that authority in keeping us out because we are sinners, we are sinful, we are guilty. But now, here after the resurrection, he has made a way to cleanse us from our sin, and he has all authority to bring us in. It makes you think of, um, I don't know if you played in the mud much as a little kid, but you're, um, I remember digging a big hole, um, actually in my neighbor's property, and um, it was big enough for me and two friends to get inside of it, and it was raining uh, previously, and it just a bunch of clay down, down at the bottom, and we would make clay balls, and then one day it rained so much that it was like very, very full and muddy, and we were just like, why not just jump in and like completely all over my shoes, pants, everything, just this muddy clay that's probably not going to come out, and it was a blast. Uh, <laughs> um, now imagine how my mom views me walking towards the house. Am I even going to get to the door? Absolutely not, right? Uh, she has the authority, she has full authority to say to invite me in or to keep me out, right? She has the authority to do that. But what's she going to do? She's keeping me out. I am not walking on her rug. I am not walking up the carpeted stairs to the bathroom as I stand. Jesus had full authority to bring us in or keep us out before he died on the cross, before he came down from heaven and humiliated himself. When he was in heaven on the throne, he had full authority, but we weren't getting in. So when he lowered himself, divested himself of, as Philippians says, it says he didn't count it, he didn't count it being equal to God to, a thing to be grasped, right? Though he is God, he, made, he became man. And he made a way. He died in our place and he rose. And then he resumed. He was given all power and all authority. And now he uses that to welcome us in. We welcome people into the church by baptizing them, by washing them with water. This is the sign and seal of the covenant of grace. This is what Jesus has called the church to do through this command to his, his apostles. This is our initiation to being members, to being learners, disciples. Alistair, our, our little boy, um, was baptized, and he doesn't even understand the English language. But I still disciple him. I read to him, and I instruct him, and I pray with him, so that when he does understand, he will have someone there teaching him and walking with him, and he will be a learner of this word. Now that sign and seal is not effective to him outside of faith. And so I pray to God that he will have faith and that he will have that salvation, that relationship with Jesus that I do. And then when he does, that baptism, that sign and seal become real. They become real for him because they exhibit the actual relationship, that real washing the real inclusion that only comes by faith in Jesus Christ. And so we do with anybody who comes into the church and says, I believe. You get washed with water. You get initiated. You get brought into a relationship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit officially with a sign. The second area that Christ has authority over right, which is everything, um, spiritual realms, heavenly realms, but also earthly realms. Before, in the Old Testament, 
Everybody, almost everybody in here is, is Jewish in the Old Testament, right? Almost everybody in the New Testament as well. But there's this one family. There's this one nation. There's this one people that God has chosen. They're a special people. What about the rest of us? What about everybody else? Very few of us have any sort of heritage going back to Abraham. But this was always his intention. In Genesis 12, when he first actually called Abraham, or Abram at the time, in Genesis 12, he says, go from your country and your kindred, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Right? This, is Ab- this is Abram. This is the father of all Jewish people. And he says, I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Right? This is Genesis. This is the very first book of the Bible. This was God's intention always that not only this one family, Abraham's family and his children, 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 all the way down to Jesus would find salvation, but through his family, culminating in Jesus Christ, all families would be blessed. There is no family There's no type of person. There's no country or region or skin color or hairstyle or accent that Jesus does not have access to. Because all families of the earth will be blessed. He has authority over all of these things. And that's been his goal from the beginning, to bring all in through this one chosen family. He reiterates this promise throughout the Bible, and again to, to, to Isaac in ver- chapter 22 of Genesis, and in your offspring all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Right? There's no region on the earth that is off limit to him. Just trying to think about applying this in our life is, there's no, you, you may not be going far away. You may be staying here. This may be your place for life. But there's no type of person, there's no family off limits here in LaVale, Cumberland area. No family will be left untouched. Right? All families in the the world will be blessed. And so this is an encouragement for us that there's, there's, you might see some people that you think are too young for you to, to be talking to about this. Or you might see some people who you, who you think are too old. But the thing is that this unity we have with Christ crosses all those barriers. The thing that we have in, in common together as a, as a church is that we have Christ in us. And so no matter how different we are from other people, if, they, if Christ chooses to act on them and to change them, to bring them in, then we become brothers. We become equals. We become disciples of Jesus, the one teacher, Jesus Christ. Christ has all power over earthly realms, and that means that no earthly power can stand in his way. Um, There's a a quote from the uh, early church. A man named Tertullian said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And what that informs us is, we can try and try, and, and it may not look like success to our own standards, right? Many Christians die in serving their Lord, right? But to human standards, that's not very successful. But Christ uses even that. In the early church, so many died, and then people looked on and said, why are they doing this? What do they believe so firmly? Who are they, who are they following that they would just choose to, to die rather than reject him. And because of that witness, the church exploded across the globe. 
In our weakness, he is strong. And Jesus, though he had all power, came and became weak so that he could provide salvation. In much the same way, a lot of our service that we do in the church, for the church, in our community, doesn't look extremely savvy, right? It's just relaying this really old book, the information in this really old book, the foolishness of preaching, the painstaking work of having friendships for decades, maybe, that where you don't see any fruit. It doesn't look effective from the outside. If, you, if there was somebody, like a, a big business CEO who's going to come in and, and take over here and say, actually, you know, I know a thing, a thing or two about efficiency, and we need to change this, this, and this, and this, and this. You know, we need to get some, some fog machines in here. We need to do, we need to do things differently to, to change people's minds. And to, no. Because no matter what other things we add on here, nothing is going to change a heart except Christ. No powers stand in his way. There's no borders that will not be crossed. Um, This also means that there's no moral barrier to us bringing others in. Um, And I don't think that this is a problem that, or a question that many of you have, but it may be a question that you will encounter. Um, The world um, doesn't like missionaries. They don't respect them. That may be weird to you because, I mean, when I hear the word missionary, I have great respect in my heart. I have great reverence in my heart for people who do that work. But that's not how a lot of people in the world hear that word. I remember... um, playing charades with a group of friends, and it was just this really high-paced thing. There's a lot of words, and we're getting through, and we're doing a good job. I'm on the same wavelength as, as, as this friend, and we're getting through, and the time's almost up, and he gets this last word, and he looks up, and he grabs this book, and he starts pretending, pretending like he's hitting somebody over the head over and over and over again. And I'm like, assault, uh, violence, murder, I don't know. Time's up. He said it was missionary. What? And he shows me the book. It's the Bible. I'm beating him over the head with the Bible. There's a few moments in life where somebody says something and it just sticks with you forever and ever and ever. That's one for me. Because I didn't think that anybody would think that way about these people who sacrifice and move and have next to nothing and they give everything. Because they know that in the name of Jesus, there is salvation. And if, any, if, if, if even one person comes to believe and is saved, then their entire life being in, in poverty and in, 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 a, in a foreign land is worth it. And on top of it, they get treated this way. They get thought of this way. I want to encourage you and encouraging our missionaries because they are not well respected outside of our circles. Um, Encouragement in terms of words and support and and every other thing. Um, The application here that Jesus tells us to do is to teach everything that the Lord has commanded. And we, we exercise that as a church in our, in our Bible studies and sermons and small groups, in uh, mentoring relationships with parents with their children. It could look like if, if you share the gospel with somebody and, and they're interested, it may look like going and getting coffee and sitting over just doing a one-on-one Bible study teaching them everything. We're just walking through the Gospel of Mark. An excellent place to start. Because he wants us to be equipped to serve and to live that Christian life. Those 11 disciples aren't alive anymore, right? Those ones who were sent on this great commission. But the church, the apostolic church stands. They made disciples 
who made disciples, who made disciples, who made disciples. And that's the only reason any of us have ever heard the name of Jesus. And so that is the function of the church in this commission, is that we will pass it on so that others will be brought into life. And not only that one person, but every person that that person brings in, and every person that those people bring in. All you need to become a person in this world is to be conceived and to be born. But a parent's job is not over when the baby is born. That's the beginning. So it is with the new birth. When we call people to join us, to say this prayer, to read this pamphlet, to consider this truth, if the Spirit conceives new life in them and they are born again, we as a church are called and committed to growing that person, initiating them with the water in the name of the Father, Son, and the Spirit. Equals before God, united to Christ, teaching them all things that Christ commands so that they will be able-bodied citizens, not lost, confused refugees in a kingdom. They are, they are, they are able-bodied citizens ready to serve, not a rescue project, but a fellow servant. This is only possible because of the sacrifice that Christ has made. Right? Before, he, he's, he wasn't going to let all of us muddy children in. That would be insane. We, we were going to trample our clay, muddy boots all over the kingdom. But because Christ came and died, he has washed us clean. He is growing us. And now he has all authority in heaven and on earth. He has called us as his instrument to proclaim the gospel, to make disciples of all sorts of people. So let's go to him in prayer, thanking him for his work and the strength for our task. Mm -hmm.